So I want to continue this um, response to Mel Maloney One's um, criticism of some of my ideas from a basically a Marxist materialist perspective. So uh, Mel Maloney One posts a comment on my video about uh, basically white heady and empiricism. He writes, "I disagree with what you said that experience is primary. Matter." i.e. the material world that exists independent of us, is primary. Consciousness, thought, ideals, sensations, and experience are secondary. Our sensations are the bridge that connects consciousness to the physical world. Consciousness is a material process, a product of matter organized in a certain way. But that doesn't constitute as matter. Matter is the category denoting the external world. Thought is the reflection of it. So again, I wouldn't want to take the perspective that thought creates reality, or that I wouldn't want to take the Berkeleyan perspective that when I don't look, the world behind me may as well not exist. Um, to be, though, is to be perceived, though in a different sense. Not like Berkeley meant it, but like Whitehead uh, meant it. Which is to say that uh, matter is always experiential. And while it's certainly objective, it's also subjective. And I think the problem here is that um, a materialist, or at least a, a mellow Maronian, uh, looks at sensation, looks at it, I guess it's an interesting choice of metaphor, but uh, sensation, or you know, the empirical observation of an external world and what can be measured objectively in that external world becomes the only thing we admit into science. So in other words, inner experience, introspective, meditative, contemplative, intuitive, emotional experience becomes merely subjective and can't be admitted into the core of science. Uh, it's just no better than hearsay. Uh, the problem with this is that part of our knowledge of objective reality comes through our bodies and in our non-sensory perception. So there are outward facing senses and you know usually we think of the eyes. The vision is what allows science and accurate observation and measurement to be possible. Um, it's and, and we, we get lost in this uh, abstraction, this abstraction of a world where we think all we know about that world is comes through our eyes, when really, uh, you know, David Hume famously pointed out that we have no sensory experience, it can, you know, if we conceive of sensory experience as merely the external world as it is passively received uh, to vision, basically, um, then we have no evidence for causality. Uh, of course, I would say, I, I don't agree with Hume that therefore causation is speculation. No, I think we look elsewhere and experience, rather than the outward facing senses, we look to our embodied experience, uh, so our sort of kinesthetic uh, felt sense of presence in the world. Causality is, an example of, of causation would be when a man is angry and yelling at you, you feel it anxious. Uh, you are objectively met with his emotion, and to be objectively met with it means for it to have been absorbed into your own subjectivity without you having a say about it. It's simply there in your experience. Um, so, uh, in, in a similar way, my agency, my ability to respond to this person who's angry is determined by a different sort of causality. Instead of it being imposed on me, I have to achieve it. Um, and, you know, life is a constant 
battle between these these two tendencies to be sort of uh, subject to the world and to uh, yourself make the world or make your way through it as an agent, uh, autonomous in some way. Um, and you know, I think that in our in in the court of experience itself, rather than just the narrow confines of scientific empiricism, um, in the court of experience of human life in its in its totality, uh, I think emotion and artistic and moral uh, values, uh, intuitions, spiritual insights, wisdom, these are just as objective as any uh, physical, uh, you know, equation of physics. Um, and so reality is more than uh, matter. Reality is matter come alive. Matter come alive and come to be conscious of itself. So somehow our picture of matter has to include that whole picture. It can't just, you know, I think we, we really do need to sort of embrace a tradition which has been completely rejected by a sort of enlightenment scientific rationalism. That is the idea of uh, the cosmos as a sort of hierarchy or great chain of being where you have the mineral, mineral realm, you have the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human, the angel, the divine. Uh, that seems to better uh, be more adequate to our actual experience of the world than the sort of abstract conceptions of, of physical science, which uh, certainly they are true. But my uh, my ideal version of science is is one where experience itself is clarified and uh, deepened and that we actually gain a better sense of how we are related to the universe than we had before. But it seems that a more materialistic science wants to say that no, everything you experience is an illusion and the reality or the reality is composed of, of these objective mathematical descriptions over here. Your experience is a mere derivative of these more fundamental principles, right? I think uh, that is to uh, misplace concreteness. Uh, it's the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, as Whitehead would put it, which is to say that you're mistaking an abstraction for the living, breathing uh, life that you lead. You know, you're forgetting that all of that abstract knowledge came through your humanity. The fact that you are a human being allowed you to come up with this abstract conceptual system of forces interacting with, you know, atoms, uh, which you then replace your experience with. Well, at least you imagine you could, you never are really going to achieve that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not a Kantian, but in an argument against a materialist, I'm going to point out Kantian insights because they are relevant to uh, a sort of materialistic absolutism. I think we need to move beyond the whole uh, subject-object division, though. Uh, I think idealism and materialism will always be uh, in cahoots with one another because they, they require one another. Yeah, idealism is a reactionary philosophy. It's always been the more esoteric and uh, sort of, it's never been as popular as uh, materialism, but it's it's certainly been uh, a constant presence and it, it sort of is what allows objectivism in whatever form to continue deepening its own, its own motives and its own insights uh, because it's never had the whole truth and the criticism opposed to it by idealism is valid for that reason, that it continually spurs development.